what Paul's going to do is he's going to take three people and mix them into this passage. One is going to be the lost person. The other one is going to be the person who is walking in the spirit. And the third one is going to be that person in the middle who is a believer, but they are carnally minded. They're not seeking the things of God. They're living in discipline and correction because they're living in the world for the flesh. Because the mind is set on the flesh, it's hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. That's the unbeliever. Cannot do the law, cannot live the way they're supposed to. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Today, if you're a good person and yet you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, understand this. Whatever you're doing that's good is not pleasing God. Because the thing He wants you to do is to receive His Son. To believe and trust in Jesus and He alone for your salvation. These good things that you're doing may be nice. But they're not pleasing to God. Amen. Notice, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells. In you. Okay, so now, if you have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God dwells in you, you don't have to be under the control of the flesh. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Okay, now he just drew a big line in the sand and said, if you are a person who has the Spirit of God, you don't have to live in the flesh. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you're not a person who's been born again, you're not His. He does not have the Spirit of Christ. He does not belong to God. That's what verse 9 says. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, that's us, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. So, yes, I have a body that is dealing with this sin and my body is going to die if the Lord doesn't come before that happens. But he's even in the process of redeeming that body. Ultimately, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness, because of Jesus, because of my faith and trust in him. But look at verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So even the part that's struggling right now is going to be changed and transformed and made a resurrection body. And this is all happening through his spirit. Now, if you, if you see these various things go by, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead... And he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead and his spirit who dwells in you. If, you, if you've not noticed these, these phrases as you go through, this passage, passage is so Trinitarian because it identifies the spirit of Jesus as the Holy Spirit. It also identifies the spirit of God as the spirit of Christ and the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. And so this passage is crying out the reality of the Trinity that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet one God. Notice in verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh. What am I going to live for now that I can live in the Spirit and I don't have to be controlled by the flesh? What would be my obligation? Not to the flesh. Not to the flesh. To live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. Carnal Christian. Carnal Christian. If you and I are living our life with one foot in the world and one foot in the things of God, we are in the process of losing that wrestling match, not for our salvation, but for us to live the kind of life that will bring us Everything the Lord has promised. You see, the Lord has promised that if we're walking with Him, that we would have peace. We would have joy. We would have victory over the enemy. We would overcome. 
And yet if I'm living in the things of the world at the same time saying that I'm a child of God, what happens is, is that my Christian life is miserable. It's like a death. It's not what God intended. And so that's why he disciplines me and he corrects me in his love to bring me out of that way of living. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, sons is underlined in that passage so that you understand this is not just what we're going to see in a moment, children of God. Children of God is to say that you've been born again. You've been birthed by God. You're one of his kids. But when you see this phrase, these are sons of God, this is talking about inheritance. This is talking about what has been given to the father, from the father to his son. This is the position that we have, that we belong to God. And we have these privileges that become ours because of Jesus. This is what God wants us to experience. Notice in verse 15. For if you have not received, for you have not received the spirit of slavery. Leading to fear again. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out. Abba, Father, Aramaic, Daddy, personal, intimate relationship, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies not to our spirit. The Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, that we have been born again, that we belong to Him. But it's more than just we have this spiritual birth, but that we have this position in the family, in the things that God has planned for us so that we can go beyond just existing. But we can walk in his power. And notice in 17, it explains some of that. If children were heirs, heirs also, of, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, whatever the father has for Jesus. You get your part. Everything that has come. He intends to share with us. Now you and I get excited about. When we think about heaven. When we think about you know uh, eternal life. We think about forgiveness of sin. We think about all of the, the ways that we can serve God. And the power of the spirit. When somebody. You talk to someone. You say. Nominate committee. Says to a person. You know God's put it on our heart. Ask you. Whether you would consider, prayerfully consider being a, a Sunday school teacher. And that person says, well, no, I can't do that. And we said, we'd say, what? You're absolutely right. And we don't want you to do it. What we want you to do is find out if God wants to do that through you. By the Spirit. In your spiritual giftedness. Not in your ability, but as the work of the Spirit through you. And so, this is a life. This is a way of being. That God does this. But when we get to verse 18, we're not so sure we want to share in all of the things that come with sharing the things of Christ. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us or to us. The idea is, is that Christ has suffered on our behalf. He wrestled with spiritual beings. You saw that in the temptation. You saw that in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he wrestled not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of darkness in high places. And he was victorious. And now because he lives within us by his spirit, we can wrestle with these principalities and powers. Not in our flesh. But with the word of God, that's what Jesus used whenever he was facing temptation. And, and the devil would say, well, you know, the scripture says you could do this or that. And Jesus said, yeah, and the Bible also says this. And the devil will try to twist scripture and try to give us a, a reason to go back to the flesh. Or to say that God cannot use us in some way. And in fact, we were never called to do it on our own. And we will never be victorious over the flesh aside from him. And that is why that slide says faith on every single one of them that you've seen. 
Because this is a life of trusting God to bring us through. Just a few more slides I want you to see. Passages. Galatians 6. This is also Paul. Inspired in the Holy Spirit. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. When we live as believers in the things that our body desires to do, our flesh wants those lusts and all of those things, whatever that is, a lust for power, a lust for food, a lust for, for, for whatever, these things are going to cause corruption. But the one who sows puts their thought, invests their life, becomes a part of the things of the Spirit, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So this is the idea that we want to follow. Notice in verse 9, let us not lose heart. You lose heart? Come on now, we lose heart. There are times when we're wrestling in these situations and we get discouraged and we get fearful and we lose heart. And the call is, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, Let us do good to all people. Yeah, can we do something about oppression? Let's do it. Can we do something to bring it into abortion? Let's do it. Can we do something to help people who are truly in poverty and need encouragement and help? Let's do that. Let us do good to all people. And especially to those who are in the household of faith. This is God's call in our life. Notice in 2 Corinthians. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul says, I was having, I got to go to heaven, see this vision. To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, and here's where we're going, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. No, I can't do that. Great. That means that Jesus can do it through you. And in your weakness, he can show his power in the things that you cannot do as you present yourself to him for him to use as a living sacrifice, then people can see, you know, they struggled in this and, and they couldn't share their faith. They, they didn't want to. They even tried to persuade people it wasn't a good idea to do or whatever it might be. And yet, instead of just emphasizing my strength, my strength, my strength, I go to the Lord and say, I say, Lord, look, my weakness, my struggle, my battle, my fear. And he says, my grace, is sufficient for you. I want to reveal my strength through your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, I don't want to cre create ones of my own, but for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The strength of God is able to be shown through my life. Peter is having a conversation with Jesus in Mark chapter 10. And it's about what's going to be the blessing in this life for the struggle. Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Peter said, Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecution. And in the age to come, eternal life. 
But many who are first will be last. And the last first. Can we just quickly say about this passage? I don't know how many cars I have here today, but I would suspect that if I asked most any of you, I need a car, could I borrow a car, what would you say? I've got a lot of cars, you have my car too. How about if I needed a place to stay, and you knew I needed a place to stay, would you allow me to use your house? Yes, you would, and you would do that for each other. Why? Because you already have. I saw you. Somebody flooded. Move in with us. We don't have anything to eat. Come and eat with us. You need transportation. Let me take you. And so already, because of the church, we see that the Lord is at work providing for us. Some of you that don't have mothers, but you have someone in this congregation who is a spiritual mother, a spiritual father, a spiritual brother, sister, that God has been faithful to keep the truth of this past. And yes, there will be persecutions because we're in enemy territory. Remember, we're wrestling not with flesh and blood. But we do this, we walk with Him, not in our flesh, but in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that in the age to come, this is going to be eternal life. For many of us who think, you know, spiritual entitlement, I guess, I don't know. Many who are first will find out that we really weren't all that in a bag of chips. That somebody that we really didn't think was all that special was really walking with the Lord by faith. That they were, in fact, filled with the Spirit, dealing with their demons, if you please, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were living in the midst of a struggle in victory. We didn't even know the battle that they were facing as they went through it. But some of us who are.